Hey, audio everyone, Lost Theory here. We're back in this little thing to talk about something I think is very important to talk about, and that is redemption arcs. Because who doesn't love a good redemption arc, honestly? I think it's one of those keen little things that I think a lot of people want to relate to, or relate to in general, and feel like it's this ever changing, ever growing sort of um, feeling. Because, you know, Redeeming yourself is always a very interesting bit piece, and it's not always done. And it's not always in full effect. For redemption, there can be highs and lows. There could be no redemption at all in the end. But what really matters most is just the simple fact that people are trying to change themselves for better. Um, for the most part. Because sometimes redemption arcs aren't exactly... You don't always go to the, the best side of the woods and whatnot. I think it's really hard for a lot of people to kind of let go of that guilt and everything that they feel whenever they look into themselves and they see the bad things that they've done in their life. And I personally, I don't feel like I have a lot of bad things that I've done in my life, but I wouldn't inherently call myself a good person. It's just more so the fact that I'm not a bad person uh, over anything else. But that is aside the point. The point is that there's a lot of people that have a lot of guilt, a lot of anger, they do a lot of mistakes, and they do have to redeem themselves in sort of way, shape, or form. Perhaps it's the whole entire, I beat God of War 4, and I have feelings for Kratos because Kratos is really just trying to be a good dad, but really Kratos as a whole is a terrible, terrible human being and monster. Yeah. Kratos is not the best person, obviously. He's killed numerous people, he doesn't care about a lot of people's lives. He did not care about the majority of Greece when he decided to take down all the gods. Effectively enough, he is a very selfish person that did not care about the consequences of his actions, but rather just the revenge of his actions. And of course, this plays out very wonderfully in, in God of War 3 for a lot of people. They like the whole entire, they kill Zeus, they kill all the gods that they can kill. And they have a really good time with it because, you know, hey, it's just a hack and slash and Kratos is just bloodthirsty monster. And while they do try to give him some sort of redemption with the whole entire, like, hey, Pandora is kind of like my daughter, even though she's a weapon or a or freaking a thing to open Pandora's box to do the other stuff and all that such. Honestly, I think it's probably the weakest God of War story by and large uh, when it comes to the big main three. But... I think it's only because it tends to underplay a lot of the bad things that Kratos did in his past. In the first God of War game, you see Kratos as this sort of um, sympathetic, uh, sympathetic person that gets tricks into killing his whole entire family. You do know about uh, how he killed a bunch of innocent bystanders, how he is a big destruction tool for the God of War, how he's this like amazing warrior fighter, and it's like, okay, cool. I get it. It makes sense that he wants to take on Ares, because Ares is the one that did this to him. He enslaved himself to Ares. Ares tricks him into doing something that he does not want to do. He wants to help his family. He ends up killing his family. Then he go, therefore, just wants to go after Hades. Well, Ares. He's actually a really good guy in, a, in Greek mythology, including in the God of War series. He actually isn't that bad. But, beside the point. <laughs> Bigger point being... God of War 1, he is very sympathetic towards his actions. In God of War 2, Kratos is betrayed by his, um, by the, by his big boss boy, um, Zeus. So Zeus comes in and just like, hey, put all your energy in this sword because it's really cool, right? And he could kill this boss monster. So he's like, okay, put all the god stuff in there. Zeus betrays him, gets flinged back, uh, uh, into Hades, almost dies, and effectively enough, goes back in time to stop himself from doing all that, or um, rather get the weapon that is the God of War, like, sword itself, and tries to kill Zeus. Eventually enough, we understand that he wants to kill Zeus. Then later on, we find out via Athena that Zeus is his father, this is that, and or the other, and he ends up killing Athena in uh attempt to kill Zeus. Now, this is, by and large where things tend to fall off because from what's become of just like, hey, you know, wanted some petty revenge against this thing, it's now just like a father-son like trilogy, quadrilogy sort of situation. It's like more of a curse than it is anything else. 
And then he just does it again in God of War 3. He ends up killing him. There's not much redemption going on. He ends up quote-unquote killing himself. And that would be the end of the God of War series. Of course, this is a... Uh, falls along with the whole entire Greek tragedy thing. If you do not know about Greek tragedies in particular, they do not end well because you do not talk about the gods in a bad way and you're supposed to talk about the gods in a good way. So killing a god, really bad. So that means that Kratos has to die as terms of a Greek tragedy and whatnot. I mean, yes, Kratos does have to face his demons about, you know, killing his family and whatnot, but it's not nearly as great as it is. There's also some extra little bit pieces in between with the PSP games. Really good games that actually flesh out Kratos' character between uh, 1 and 2. And yeah, one uh, yeah between 1 and 2. Uh, just This is the first. Uh, well, 1 uh, takes place before Kratos got a war, Kratos. Um, that's on Ascension. It's um, Chains of Olympus. Uh, it's not particularly great uh, in terms of like the whole entire thing. But the next one goes to Sparta infinitely better and honestly I would say uh far better than God of War 3 is in all honesty when it comes to it he go face he goes to face his brother and just like oh no I have a brother and he actually has a growing moment with his brother in comparison to 2 or 3 which just didn't really have it the reason why I like 2 the most in all honesty is because it has a lot of Greek uh references and whatnot a lot of Greek mythology a lot, uh like the references. There you go. That's what I was looking for. So why do exactly I mention the whole entire God of War series as a whole here on this vlog and whatnot? I could mention this anywhere else. The main reason why I say this is because in God of War 4, they acknowledge the fact that Kratos is not a great person. Or rather, the fact Kratos acknowledges the fact that he's not a good person. He has a lot of demons to deal with. He has a lot of problems and actions he has to do. And yet at the same time, he has to raise his boy to do everything that he can to make that boy to be better than he is. And already he does a lot of a lot of uh, bad things, a lot of good things when it comes to interacting with Kratos and he, it kind of sort of well, I guess to basically say he learns to look past his father's mistakes despite the fact that he does not know enough about his father's mistake to really be judgmental against him. By all means, I feel like Kratos as a person effectively does not want to be forgiven does not want to change in any way, shape, or form. And it makes a lot of sense because he's done a lot, a lot of terrible things and he's effectively brought the end of the world to Greece. So when you put that in the hands of uh, like a, another person in particular, just like looking at it at the outside, they're not going to see the whole entire, like, this killing monster that happened. They're going to see their father, their figure, and all that such. And that's exactly what Artie does. He sees Kratos as the person that he is now, not as the person that he once was. Of course, he can't see the other part because that person that was there is gone. He's just not there. He, Kratos wants to better himself. He wants to help his boy. He wants to be on his side, support him, and do everything he can to make sure that he himself does not turn out to be um, another one. He doesn't want the boy to turn out to be him, basically. And it makes sense in terms of redemption arc, in terms of just the way that he treats himself throughout, the way he carries himself. This is a way that a lot of people feel in terms of redemption. I really imagine this because it's the most freshest in my mind when it comes to people being redeemed and whatnot. But it gives a striking resemblance to the way that I feel a lot of people feel about um, them wanting to redeem themselves or them feeling guilty about some certain situations and whatnot. Now, I'm not saying that people that have all these things to do to like change themselves and right the wrongs and their mistakes and whatnot should forget whatever they did or to just let go of it and just live in the moment effectively. That's not what redemption is about. It's about learning from your mistakes and it's about learning to be a better person overall. Unfortunately, a lot of people have to go through different mistakes to learn the same lesson. Sometimes they don't learn it the first time. Sometimes they learn it the fifth time or even the fiftieth time. But the bigger point of the matter being, you learn it eventually and you, you stick to that and you, and you get going with it. And that's what redemption is all about. It's about learning from the mistakes. It's about living with the mistakes that you did make and being a better person. Hence, God of War 4 Kratos being a far better character in comparison to God of War 3 Kratos. Now, I say all of this because as someone that is trans, I don't get the best responses the first time I tell people this thing in particular. And the first time that I actually told my mother, she did not 
take it well at all. I talked to my mother about this a while, while back. I want to say around when I was 18, 19 years old, uh, we decided to go to a TGI Fridays, and I decided to tell her this and uh, tell her that right there and then. The way that I figured is that she would be the most supportive person of all to me for the situation. She's always been fairly supportive when it comes to a lot of things that I do. And it seemed to me at the time that she would just be way too over supportive and I probably would hate that. But the opposite kind of happened. And I'm not saying that she kicked me out or anything. She didn't do any like horrendous thing. But she distilled my trust significantly and it's taken till now to start getting it back. Now by no means... Do I think my mom is the most perfect person in the world? She's made plenty of mistakes, and for the most part, uh, I think of her as a good person. I don't think what she did was particularly wrong for her to do, but it stopped me from trusting her the way that I used to trust her. And that hurt a lot because, effectively enough, I didn't really have anyone to brightly trust within a given time frame. I want to say about three years or so. I didn't have anyone to rightly trust until a few years until a few years later I found some friends where I could find in such a thing and just it just kind of worked out that way. Kind of happens some bad times just what it is. Effectively enough, my mother in terms of trust, support and what I could tell her was gone entirely. And it's not like my mom didn't have a lot of other stuff that she's dealt with in her childhood and whatnot and I don't know how she actually was for her childhood. I don't know that. I just know her the way that I've known her now. i know that she used to be a very angry person, but slowly but surely she grew to be a better person because of that. She no longer fights as much as she used to. She's very, how to say, I want to say gentle. More thoughtful interactions? Maybe the best way to say it? But suffice to say, um, it was definitely a thing where I thought she would always have my back, and she didn't. And it did suck for a while. Fast forward about five to seven years later, when I finally get on track to doing all the things that I want to do, and I finally tell her. This time, the reaction itself is very mild, very just like, oh, okay, that's who you are, is what you are. And that was it. I'm not sure how she actually really feels about this given situation that I put her in and whatnot. But the way that she handled it then and there tells me that she's at least willing to keep going with the situation. And she understands that it's not rightly her choice to decide what I do with my life. And that means that this was a growing moment for her. And she eventually did understand that what she did was the wrong thing that she should have done. She should have been supported to some sort of degree. She should have been able to let me do that and whatnot. And she grew as a person. And that made me happy because that's kind of like the best thing that you can do. It's just learn from your mistakes and whatnot. Now, I'm not saying that a relationship is 100% uh, the way it was that it was back then, but it's getting there. And that's probably the most important part is that these relationships are never fully doomed as long as you learn to live with it. As long as you learn to live yourself as a person and just keep going on with things and just just decide to learn effectively to be better than what you are before. And it's something that I always try to do. I'm not saying I don't make mistakes. I'm not saying that uh, I'm fully perfect in any way, shape, or form. I'm still learning a lot of things that I have to learn. And I feel like it's a very important thing, especially as someone who's a trans person needs to go do, is just understand that just there's some things in life that just you can't handle at some certain points in time. And it's not your fault for doing it. And that goes the same for people that need redemption, that people feel guilty about things, people that feel uncertain about things. It's just, it's not going to always happen right away. And that's probably the hardest lesson that you do learn when it comes to growing up, is just people have different time frames. They just do. And it's the worst feeling because it's such a cliche thing. It's just like, it's not your time yet, but it's going to be your time eventually. And you're just like, but I want to do it now. I want to do it now. I want to do it now. Because everybody else is doing it now. Why shouldn't you? But you're you. You can't change that. You shouldn't change that. That's 
what makes it different, what makes it unique, what makes it all go the way that it does. And you're the only one that knows your experiences firsthand, and you're the only one that could properly treat yourself the harshest or treat yourself the bestest, I guess. Well, maybe not the bestest, but at least be able to forgive yourself. Out of all the people that you can forgive, you're the only one that can do it. And even if it's just forgiving yourself enough to just continue to live and go on, I think that's the most important thing to know. People could always change within a month, within a year, within a day. It's kind of ridiculous how much change could actually happen, when and where. And even the best of people and the worst of people could change to be something that you don't recognize. It's kind of like, like, like the redemption. So yeah, till next time then, everybody. Sign on. Bye-bye.